Welcome to the Berkshires Gone By, history and folklore about the westernmost and most beautiful county in Massachusetts. I'm your host, Brooke. Whose side are you on? That question was put to every inhabitant of the New World over and over again. Now, looking back, we Americans tend to side with the English when we're talking about the French and Indian War. But then, a short while later, during the Revolutionary War, we were fighting against the English for our own independence. And who was there to help us? The French! Then along comes the War of 1812. This time, it's the Americans versus the British, again. But the Native Americans have sided with the British, thinking that they were at least better than the Americans who were actively pushing them off their land. But they had sided with the French during the French and Indian War, and opposed the English. It suffices to say that it was a very confusing time for anyone who dared to admire one side for too long. Thus begins the daring story of a Berkshire family, and one daughter in particular. A family who'd been in the Berkshires for longer than the Berkshires were even called the Berkshires. In 1629, a man named Richard Ingersoll, from Bedfordshire, England, landed at Salem, Massachusetts. Five generations later, Thomas Ingersoll was born in 1749 in the town of Westfield, Massachusetts. He married another Westfielder, a woman named Elizabeth Dewey, only 17 years old at the time. He was 26. The couple moved to the outskirts of the colony, Great Barrington, Massachusetts, in the Berkshires in 1774. There, their first child, a daughter, was born on September 13, 1775. Laura Ingersoll. Their home stood where the Mason Library now stands, and the land was cleared all the way back to the river, where the children would fish and play, and more children came soon. Three more girls, all about two years apart. Elizabeth was born on October 17, 1779. Myra was born in 1781, and Abigail in 1783. Their father Thomas was doing well. He fought on the side of the colonists during the Revolutionary War, and acquired advancements in his rank quickly. When the war was over, he became magistrate of the town. That and his day job of working as a milliner, meaning he made hats, meant that he earned a pretty good living. This money enabled him to support his family well. But all the money in the world couldn't save them from tragedy. Little baby Abigail had to be given away to be raised by his sister. For only five months after her birth, the girl's mother, Elizabeth, died. Thomas certainly had his hands full with the three older girls, he couldn't also handle a tiny baby. And in an era before formula, feeding her would have been a nightmare. A year passed, and the father and his little daughters did the best they could. Laura was ten now, old enough to be expected to do much of the housework and look after her younger siblings. But soon she wouldn't have to be the lady of the house, because her father met and married the sweet Mercy Smith. Mercy had never had any children of her own, and was a rather young widow. She stepped right into the girls' lives like a breath of fresh air. She taught the girls things their mother would have, like reading, the finer points of cooking, sewing, and needlework. So when she died just four years later of tuberculosis in 1789, the family was again devastated. But tuberculosis is a slow-moving illness and they could all see that her end was near. Again, Laura stepped up to run the household and care for her ailing stepmother. After Mercy's passing, their father didn't wait long to remarry. His broken heart needed someone to cling to, and he found that person in Sarah Bacchus. Sarah was also a young widow, and the marriage added a stepsister named Harriet. The match ended up being one of love, and more children came along quickly. Quite a few more. Three boys and four more girls. As the children grew, 
Their father was off earning more ranks until he reached that of Major and helped end Shay's rebellion. But he understood that this was a confusing and heartbreaking time. Loyalists, those still loyal to the King of England, were being shunned, convicted of treason, forced to leave their homes, and just all around treated horribly. It was hard for some people, who still had family back in England, or who hadn't even come to America that long ago, to be expected to stand against their king, the symbol and monarch of their homeland. After the Revolutionary War, the economy tanked. The newly independent nation floundered without its anchor in the old world to keep it steady. Thomas, like most, found his income dwindling and worried about his large family. He finally came to the conclusion that they weren't going to be able to make it in the United States. So Thomas met with a man named Joseph Brandt. He was a leader of the Mohawk. Joseph was going to bring him to the best lands in Canada, where Thomas planned to move his family. He and four of his comrades all traveled north, where they were granted 66,000 acres. There the group founded a future town that they planned to dub Oxford on the Thames. The only hitch was that they had to get 40 other families to move there in the next seven years. So, the Ingersolls picked up all of their belongings, said goodbye to their family and friends, and left Great Barrington and the Berkshires. Thomas's oldest child, Laura, was considered sort of old at the time, 21, to still be unmarried. If she'd found someone by that time, her family's leaving might not have inspired her to leave as well. She probably would have stayed in Great Barrington with her husband. But she hadn't met anyone yet. So when her father told them his plan, she went with them. It was 1795, and the entire family was starting from scratch. Quite literally. There was nothing there. They would be founding a town and would have to travel great distances to fetch supplies. Unlike Great Parrington, which was a thriving town when they left it, their new location was a desolate forest. So with so many young mouths to feed, the family instead decided to stay in Queenston, Ontario, just the other side of Niagara River from Lewiston, New York, while their newly acquired land was cleared for them and a cabin constructed on the property. While in Queenston, Thomas ran a tavern. But things didn't go as planned. There was growing disdain for the late arriving loyalists. And most of all, all the free land they were being offered. In the face of this discontent among its citizens, Canada discontinued the land grants and yanked the offers to many who'd already been given them. This included the Ingersolls. Everyone had already moved to the cabin just a short while before. All but Laura, that is but they were only able to stay in the cabin for a brief time before their dreams were crushed. All that work for nothing. So they packed up again and moved to Credit River, where Thomas became an innkeeper in 1805. It wasn't what he'd wanted, but it was where he'd ended up, and he did well at it. But seven years later, he died after a stroke. His wife Sally took over the inn, she would be there for all the children, until her passing, in 1833. Laura hadn't moved with the rest of her family, because she had met and fallen in love with James Secord, and had stayed with him in Queenston. He was one of five sons, and rather wealthy, too. They built a house in St. David's, not far away, and ran a store from the front rooms. They welcomed their first child, Mary in 1799, followed by four more, Charlotte, Harriet, Charles, and Apollonia. Laura's husband wasn't just a successful merchant, but also a military man. Here is where I give you the most simplified explanation of the War of 1812 that I can. It is the war that essentially made Canada. The war when they fought for their independence and fended off a foreign invader. Back in Europe, England was at war with France, per usual. This time, France was being run by Napoleon Bonaparte. One way to weaken France was to cut its supplies. This included from the U.S., still a young nation 
and doing much of its business with Europe. The fact that shipments from the U.S. were being raided by the British was infuriating to Americans. That, and anyone suspected of being English, was kidnapped from American ships and forced to serve in the British Army. But the United States really didn't want to take either side. It was bad for business. But after it was found that the British were supplying Native Americans in the Northwest with arms, Native Americans that the United States were fighting with, the United States decided they had had enough of British interference. So war was declared on England. Canada, being part of England's collection of territories, was ripe for invasion, and Canada knew it. But Canadians didn't hate Americans. In fact, many Americans lived there. And New England, who still traded briskly with Old England, was horrified to hear about the war. But the friendly connections between Canada and the U.S. were why the generals thought it would be such an easy target. That Canada would pretty much welcome liberation. But these American generals had underestimated Canada's loyalty to Britain. And the United States only had a militia. No standing army. And were up against one of the world's best armies. During the bombing of Detroit, General Hall, an American general, was found drunk and gibbering with fear. He'd assumed this fight would be easy, but instead found his forces being crushed. He asked for a ceasefire. The British laughed and threatened instead to blow them all to kingdom come. Hall gave up. A white flag was flown for the first and only time on American soil to a foreign enemy. Three American invasions into Canada were failures, but they did do well at sea. Old Ironsides earned its credit at this time. The Star Spangled Banner was written after a sea battle as well, so the Americans were given enough courage to try a ground invasion again, and they planned to invade the area where the Ingersolls and Laura Secord now lived. James Secord, Laura's husband, had left for battle. And in October of 1812, Laura Secord heard that her husband had been badly wounded. She left her home and hurried to the battlefield. Here, along with many other women, she combed the bodies of the dying and wounded, searching for him. There James was, shot through the shoulder and the leg. She got a few others who'd been searching for their own loved ones to help her hoist him onto a horse and led him back home. But the trip had taken just long enough that no one was there when looters broke in and stole almost everything not nailed down. The area the family inhabited fell to American forces, and soon after losing almost everything they owned and struggling to replace it, soldiers moved in. They also very literally moved in, into civilian homes. Canadian citizens of occupied territories were forced to accommodate American militiamen who would then be going out to fight their Canadian countrymen. It was an incredibly tense situation. The Americans that were staying in the Secord home felt safe enough. The man of the house was for the most part bedridden. The only other people in the building were a bunch of children and Laura, a mere woman. Laura noticed their disregard for her and that they didn't even really notice she was there unless their food wasn't made for them, when and the way they wanted it. As they got comfortable, and ate practically everything the family had, they developed loose lips. This led to them speaking freely in front of Laura, as she cooked or took care of the children. This included talking about secret American plans. It was June 21st, 1813, when she overheard them talking. They were going over plans for a surprise attack. They'd rally with the rest of their unit and spring this attack on the British troops under the command of Lieutenant James Fitzgibbon at a place called Beaver Dams. If the Canadian forces were defeated there, they would hold an even larger chunk of the Niagara Peninsula. She was torn as she served them the rest of their meal that evening. She pondered her situation. She was an American. Her family had been part of Massachusetts history since they stepped ashore in its very earliest years, but now she was in Canada. This was her home now. Canada was a British territory. She certainly wasn't British, but those British soldiers at Beaver Dams were fighting for her home. And damn it, she'd been on battlefields. 
She'd seen those bodies among the wounded, heard the bitter cries of their wives, who weren't as lucky as she. Laura's home had been looted, and family members displaced. It didn't matter, she supposed, whether or not these men in her home were American or not. This was a war, and she didn't want anyone else to die. If they were able to surprise the army at Beaver Dams, she knew that more men would. Probably many, many more. And there was only one thing to do. That night she made extra food, breakfast in advance, and went to her children. She told them that she had to leave before the first light of morning, that she had something terribly important to do, but that she'd try with all her might to return to them. She instructed her oldest to make excuses for her absence, that she was working in the barn or doing the washing, if the soldiers even noticed that she was gone, but to also be sure to serve their meals on time, for they would most certainly notice she had left if there weren't anything to eat. And just as she planned the next morning, she snuck from the home, just before the sky began to lighten. Some stories say that she went all by herself. Another story says that she brought along a cow. The cow would serve as an excuse if she were stopped by any enemy soldiers. She would tell them that she were on her way to sell it, or perhaps had just bought it, and was taking it home. In ill-suited women's shoes of the day, and long skirts that snagged on everything they swished by, she hurried through the forest. She sort of knew the way. Guessing was the best she could do at some spots. Mile after mile through marshes over rivers, she hurried. At one point, she stumbled across the camp of some natives. She was a little frightened, but also determined. Laura found her resolve and walked into that camp. They turned out to be Mohawk, allies of the British. She asked them to lead her the rest of the way. The Mohawk obliged, and brought her all the way to the Deku house, where Lieutenant Fitzgibbon and his men were headquartered. She hurried in and told Fitzgibbon all that she had heard. He readied his men, made sure that they were well armed, and sent them to their posts. He also had a very large number of Mohawk there, ready to fight with them. Laura was thanked for her effort, and she turned back home. She walked all the way back, just as she had walked all the way there. Forty miles round trip. Fitzgibbon and his men waited, and waited. Some of the men began to wonder aloud if Laura Secord had been wrong. After all, she was just a silly woman. Fitzgibbon told his men to stay at their posts regardless. On the 24th, the Americans attacked, just as Laura had said, and the British were ready. Most of the Americans were captured, although some were killed. Chances are, many more men would have perished if this attack had been a surprise. The war eventually came to an end. The Americans went back home, and Canada was at peace. But that didn't mean that things got better for everyone. The Secord family hadn't had any money with which to restock the store at the front of the house, and it remained in disarray. The home behind it was also still much in shambles. The little resources they had didn't go very far, and they struggled to keep it livable. Altogether, they had very little income. James's long recovery and inability to work left the family in poverty, and it didn't help that there were soon two more mouths to feed. Laura and Hannah were born soon after the war. But that's not even the end of it. The Secord's oldest daughter, Mary, had gotten married and moved away to Europe with her husband. They quickly had two daughters together, but not long after, he died. Because a woman lost her right to own property upon marrying, his death left her penniless, any inheritance going to his nearest male relative. So Mary was forced to return to the home of her parents in the United States, along with her two children. James tried to get the government to assign him to a military position of some kind, but they never did. He did receive a small pension, but it simply wasn't enough. Laura, however, was told that she could work at Brock's Monument when its construction was finished, but soon discovered that the job had been given to someone else. Laura wrote to Fitzgibbon and asked him for some sort of support. She asked him to tell anyone who might be able to do something about how she had helped them out, about what she had done for the British Army that day. Fitzgibbon, still incredibly thankful, did write to the government on her behalf, but it didn't help. Soon, Laura and James's daughter 
Apollonia developed typhus and died young. James was able to find a government position and began to work his way up the pay scale. But in 1841, he died. This left them poor yet again. Even his pension stopped. And Laura didn't qualify for one of her own. She was just his wife, and what she had done that day was still unrecognized as worthy of one. Two more of her daughters were widowed, and these daughters brought their own children back to live with Grandma Laura. The lot of them were able to scrape enough money together to move into a brick home just a little bigger to suit them all, but they had very little left over. When Laura Secord heard that the Prince Regent would soon arrive in Queenston and was to be presented with a scroll upon which the names of all the men who served were written, Laura, at age 85, made her way there, found that scroll, and signed her own name upon it. Later on, when the prince asked why a woman's name was upon the list, it was explained to him the 40 miles, the courage, and now her determination to be recognized. The prince regent was so impressed by her tenacity and bravery that he rewarded her efforts with a hundred pounds sterling, an impressive sum at the time. His generosity pulled the family from poverty and allowed her to live in comfort for the rest of her life, even enabling her daughters fresh starts as well, though Harriet and her daughters preferred to live with Laura. Laura wrote two books in her later years about her harrowing journey to warn the British troops that day. She lived to be 93, passing away in 1868. She was laid to rest beside her beloved husband in the town of Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada. Her story has left a mark. There are monuments to her. She graced a postage stamp. Books tell her tale. There are several documentaries. A chocolate company changed its name to Laura Secord Chocolates in her honor. Her home, that was looted in Queenston, was restored and is a museum now. There are schools named after her. School children put on plays recreating that day. People commonly walk the same route she walked, all 20 miles one way, 40 if you go back again, and her face adorned a limited-run Canadian quarter, the land that her father had been originally granted, that encouraged the family to move to Canada from the Berkshires in the first place has since become a town, and has been named Ingersoll, after Laura and her family. She is considered a national hero in Canada. Back home in Great Barrington, where many Ingersoll descendants still live, her father's home was for a time used as the town library, but was replaced with the current structure. A small plaque has been set out front to commemorate her early years there, her childhood, and young adulthood. Here's where I tell you a personal secret. I don't live in the Berkshires. I left at age 23, almost the same age that Laura left. She moved much further away though. It only takes me about an hour to drive eastward from my childhood home and still my family's home in Lenox to my current residence. I may feel displaced, despite not even being that far away, but I am forever a Berkshire girl, much like her. My family has some deep roots in Lennox, just as hers has deep roots in Great Barrington. So when I think of her, I can't help but relate. There's a certain bit of toughness born into a Berkshireite, a drive that prevents us from balking at hardship. I can't help but think that her early life here forged her into who she was there, and that who she was when she reached Canada was just who she needed to be to make a difference. Someone strong enough to fly in the face of danger when she needed to, and to stand up for herself in her old age when she felt she was being ignored and wronged. National Canadian hero of the war considered the founding war of Canada? Not bad for a Berkshire girl. Not bad at all. This has been The Berkshires Gone By, created, written, directed, and read by myself, Brooke Renier, and co-produced by Deanna Garner. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter 
where every day we post a brand new picture related to Berkshire history. You can also follow us on Facebook, where you can find pictures and our episodes. Or visit www.theberkshiresgoneby.com, where you can find every episode ever made, along with pictures related to our topics. You can also email us at theberkshiresgoneby at gmail.com. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. Thanks for listening.